please welcome to the stage author Glenn Weldon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am delighted to be here and to talk nerd stuff. The book is about the intersection of Batman and nerd culture. I'm using Batman as a lens to look at nerd culture because I think they have a certain resonance. Uh, Batman is the ultimate nerd, at least that's the point of the book, and um, there are several different Batmen over the course of many years. Uh, and to insist, as the uh, culture now does, that the only Batman that is real is the grim, gritty, badass version, uh, is to ignore lots of history. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We can talk about the nerd culture stuff in the Q&A, but today, because this is a visual medium and comics are a visual medium, I want to go over a little bit of history. May 1939 is when it all began with this issue of Detective Comics. Now, up to this time, this is issue number 27, Detective Comics was an anthology series with 11 different short features in it uh, with uh, two-fisted detectives with names like Speed Saunders and Slam Bradley and Buck Marshall. Um, and they introduced Batman in number 27 because their walking papers, their, their uh, marching orders, were to make another Superman. Superman had come out a year before and had been hugely popular, uh, not just selling millions and millions of comics, which he did, but also as a merchandising uh, beast, uh, the first real merchandising beast uh, of, of comics, associated with comics. So uh, two guys, Bob Kane and Bill Finger, co-created Batman. If you ask Bob Kane, Bob Kane will say that he created Batman by himself. Uh, and he went on record many, many times saying that it was all his idea. In his autobiography, toward the end of his life, he gave a little bit of hint, uh, a little bit of love toward Bill Finger, but uh, it was really too little too late, because he had made his career on saying it was all his idea. Bob Kane was the artist. Bill Finger was the writer. Uh, Bob Kane went to Bill Finger with an idea for a character called the Batman. It was a dude in a red uh, long johns, basically, with giant bat wings, mechanical bat wings, blonde hair, a domino mask. And he showed it to Bill Finger, who they, they kind of bounced ideas off each other all the time. And Bill Finger said, you're calling it Batman, and, and he's got, this is red underwear, man. What do you, what do you, what do you mean? This, is, this doesn't. So he went to a dictionary, and he kind of uh, opened it to a picture of a bat and said, look, ears. Look, if he's going to be uh, a creature of the night, he's going to need uh, dark colors. If he's going to be uh, somebody who is a vigilante, he's going to want gloves so, so that you he doesn't leave fingerprints. Basically, everything that we think of today when we think of Batman came from Bill Finger, not necessarily Bob Kane. So uh, this is the first image that anybody saw. This image, uh, I don't want to keep dinging Bob Kane, but uh, he traced that image from a, a Flash Gordon comic. Uh, um, and you can see that there's still some uh, vestige of the mechanical Batwing idea, uh, but uh, yeah. This is the title page of the uh, first story of, of Batman. Actually, you can see he's not Batman yet. He is the Bat-Man. So back then, when he was introduced, he had a definite article, he had a hyphen, and he had scare quotes. He also had, if you look at that image there, uh, that doesn't necessarily strike terror into your hearts, does it? It looks a little goofy. But the important thing is, uh, you see the black silhouette against the full moon. That image, that those, that iconic, I, that iconography, iconography is going to uh, be a part of this character for his entire life. Uh, the Batman, a mysterious and adventurous figure fighting for righteousness, and apprehending the wrongdoer. There's that, that's where a hyphen should be right there between wrong and doer. In his lone battle uh, against the evil forces of society, his identity remains unknown. That's important. When this uh, story started, we met Bruce Wayne as a bored socialite who was a friend of Commissioner Gordon. We didn't find out that Bruce Wayne was Batman until the very last panel of this story. But the first time we see Batman is this. As the two men leer over their conquest, they do not notice a third menacing figure standing behind them. It is the Batman, exclamation point, the Batman, three exclamation points, in case you missed it. Um, so again, that dude down there uh, with the uh, holding the paper, uh, uh, Bob Kane traced that. Um, and these two goons have just uh, pilfered an old man's safe uh, and killed him. And so this is Batman standing, you, you can see it again, standing in front of the moon, uh, part of the iconography. And 
he looks like Batman to our modern eyes if you allow for nearly 77 years of shift. So uh, the color scheme checks out. Again, back then, it was blue with black because if you just did black without any kind of highlights in it, it would just come off as a big black smudge because that was the printing process back then. Uh, the one thing that's odd to me, well, two things. A, those uh, ears are kind of like devil's horns, kind of poking out of either side of his head, and the purple evening gloves. Those are, those are a thing. Uh, the purple evening gloves go away pretty quickly. And whenever DC Comics reprints this first issue, they kind of do away with it. But it's, it's a look. Speaking of a look, uh, check out that cape. Now, the cape is an important part of this character and always will be. In the, for about 30 years after this, the cape is just an accessory. In the 70s, uh, artists like Marshall Rogers and, and uh, other folks really make the cape a living thing. And they use it to direct the reader's eye. It becomes almost like a, a silent narrator. Here, it looks like dude is basically wearing an umbrella. Um, but that's, that's the guy. Now, the important thing to know is that uh, he was a ripoff of The Shadow. Um, that's not a controversial assertion. Both Bill Finger and Bob Kane said, yeah, we kind of just ripped off The Shadow. The first story was a ripoff of A Shadow Story, almost plot point for plot point. Uh, so both Bill Finger and Bob Kane swiped. It was, it was a thing people did. Because remember, that they're not making art here. They are churning out content. They are churning out as much as they can, as fast as they can, which is, you know, I, I, I give Bob Kane a lot of guff for, uh, for tracing as much as he did. He did a lot. Uh, it's, he, was, he was stuck, and he, he, was, he was doing what he can. But Batman was not the only shadow ripoff kind of running through comics and pulp magazines of this time. Uh, there were a hell of a lot of them. He was not even the only Bat-themed shadow ripoff. Uh, there were two others, Black Bat, that dude there with the fedora, and The Bat uh, in Black Book Detective. They didn't hang around long, although the, the Black Bat actually uh, lasted until about the 50s. But uh, yeah, so the same shtick, right? Uh, terrifying your enemies, um, uh, lurking in the shadows, mm -hmm. and uh, in, the, in the shadows case, and in Batman's case, uh, killing folk a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, but we'll, I'll come back to that in a second. This is the origin. Now, he didn't have an origin until about seven issues in. Uh, because, again, when Superman was created, uh, he, had, uh, he was a science fiction character. You needed to explain why he could jump and do all the stuff he could do. This guy was basically just a detective who dressed up. So you didn't necessarily need a backstory for him. But they gave him one eventually. Now, those three panels down there, uh, you see, are um, the origin, which we have seen in 2016 a lot. We've seen it far too many times, um, over and over again. By the way, the guy in the corner there with the red cap traced, the guy up there in the yellow hat traced, and uh, the, the guy the, the guy shooting the gun traced. Um, this whole thing takes place, this whole origin, because again, they, were, they had the uh, real story to get to, uh, takes place in two pages. Page one, page two, and that's it. Uh, that Batman down there in the corner, that is traced from a Tarzan, very famous Tarzan image uh, that Bruce Wayne traced. Now, I like the way this page looks, uh, especially with that uh, very astonishing feat of the dude in Speedos uh, raising the weight up. That just kind of anchors your eye. Uh, I like him right there as a, as a dude who is a, a scientist and a really incredibly buff weightlifter. He also, you can also tell just from visually looking at this page to the right of that image with the weightlifter, you know, he's pretty good at interior design. Um, one thing I want to put here in the, in the bottom left here, okay, this is a very famous quote, perhaps the most famous quote of this character. Criminals are a superstitious, cowardly lot, so my disguise must be able to strike terror into their hearts. Okay, C keep that in mind. In this panel, he is calling criminals superstitious. In the very next panel, he says, a bat, it's an omen. <laughs> Pick a lane, you know what I mean? Uh, so, again, but you can see the bat against the, the full, full thing of the moon. Now, the most important thing on this page is not the bat flying in, it's not the criminals are a superstitious cowardly lot, it's not how great he looks in tights, it's this panel. Now, we've seen this origin told and retold and retold, and we will see it forever. But we always skip this panel, and for me, this is what makes Batman Batman. Not what happened to him, but his reaction to it. And I swear by the spirits of my parents to avenge their deaths by spending the rest of my life warring on all criminals. That's 
key. It is not a vendetta. He's not going after the guy who shot his parents. He is going against criminals. It's not a vendetta, it's a crusade. And I use that word advisedly because it's, it's a loaded word, but it's, it, it's bigger than the thing that started him down this path. And if you forget that, you are focusing on the wrong thing. Now, we, we'll never see this today because it's hokey as hell. And uh, it's, it's a thing a child would do. It, it's a silly uh, kind of oath, right? But that is its power. Uh, these characters work, if they work at all, at a psychological elemental level. Um, and they work because they uh, key into something here. And just look at this. So he's got the, the candle flame, and then it's kind of echoed by the single tear dripping down his cheek. There's, a, there's an elemental power to this. And this is, panel is what makes uh, Batman a hero. It's what transforms him from a vigilante into somebody who is uh, in an act of self-rescue, right? He's, he's, this is how he overcomes what happened to his parents. Uh, he is dedicating himself to this notion of never again. What happened to me will not happen to anybody else because I'm not going to let it. Uh, that's, there's a simple power in that. And to forget it is, is to focus on um, this stuff. Uh, in his first year, Batman killed 24 dudes, uh, two vampires, a brace of werewolves, what would you call that, a pack? What's the collective noun for werewolves? Pack. And uh, a couple giant mutants. Um, here, uh, you can see him toting a gun. And in this panel, that's kind of tough to see, but it's just as well because there is some horrible racist imagery in this panel. Uh, he is pushing a jade statue on top of what looks like nine hapless dudes. Uh, crushing them completely, and then, uh, just to put a fine point on it, the idol of the green dragon kills its own. Well, you kind of helped, you know? You kind of, it didn't do it itself. <laughs> you, you're kind of, you gotta put some of the, you're, you're in the mix. Now, this violence terrified uh, the publisher because he was a children's character. You could pretend to yourself that uh, all these other detectives were, had, had an appeal, because again, adults read comics back then as well. Um, but it, this, this character was intended for kids. And this dark violence was something that the publisher, uh, that made the publisher very leery. Now, it would be 10, 15 years before an anti-comics crusade happened nationally, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But they just, there was a, there was a thin um, unease coming from the publisher, especially after, uh, in a panel in um, Batman number one, because he got his own self-titled comic eventually, uh, where he is flying the bat plane and gunning down people with a machine gun. And they were like, you know what? Maybe, maybe back off that a little bit. <laughs> so they wanted to do, so the publisher wanted to uh, lighten the tone. Uh, Bill Finger, the writer, thought, you know, I've created this guy who's basically, if you, beneath all this fetishist bat stuff, uh, he's a detective. He's basically Sherlock Holmes. And this is the era before thought balloons and before uh, narration, like internal monologue. So if we wanted to get access to what was going on inside Batman's head, he needed to talk to himself, which was odd. So they said, you know what? Let's give him somebody to bounce off of. It was Bob Kane's idea to make the person that he bounced off of uh, a kid, because he figured, this is being written for kids. We put a kid in it. They can identify with the character. And that's how we got the sensational character find of 1940, Robin the Boy Wonder. Now, even in the marketing, like, look at that. We are shoving this guy down your throat. Like, you're going to love this kid, uh, whether you want to or not, because he's the sensational character find of, of 1940. So the Batman, that amazing weird finger of, of night, at last takes onto his protecting mantle an ally in his relentless fight against crime. Introducing in this issue an exciting new figure, blah, 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 blah. Look at that. That is just promo copy. Now, uh, this made Batman from a dark, lone figure of the night into, look at his face. Look how proud he is. <laughs> It's like, it's, that's my boy. It's like, it's, it's like he's a little league dad, you know? The guy is just sliding home. Uh, that's uh, hugely important. Now, does anybody see, we've all heard the jokes, right? The Batman and Robin jokes, the ambiguously gay du duo jokes. Does anybody see anything here that might, I don't know, presage trouble to come? Is there anything in this copy here that stands out at you? I'm going to take a closer look. Anything here you might want to be wary of? Let's, uh, let's go a little bit closer. <laughs> Takes under his protecting mantle anally. Now, that's me, right? I, I, look at the space between 
mantle and an ally, right? Look, mantle, look at that big old space there. Look at the space between the N and the A, nothing. I'm not saying it's intentional. I'm saying dude couldn't catch a break, that all these jokes were fated to be um, because, uh, well, I mean, why? Because of panels like this, two dudes in a boat at night in a park, because it's night, because it's soft breezes and moonlight. Now, this is just now, I'm just making this stuff up, right? This is, I'm just pulling panels out of context. And you can make everything look bad if you pull panels out of context, right? <laughs> uh, and I just want to point out here that for a 10-year-old boy, Dick Grayson is jacked. Look at that. That is a deltoid. And this very famous panel, which you might have seen before. So uh, basically, the joke is, and it's not a joke, this is, this is done. So the, the villain says, not only are you doomed, but so is everyone you have touched, because he's given them a plague. Not important. Uh, Jean Loring, I've signed her death warrant. That's his girlfriend. I gave Iris West the kiss of death. That's his girlfriend. Carol Ferris, in deadly danger. That's his girlfriend. Robin, what have I done to you? <laughs> now again, none of this is intentional. But people noticed, one person in particular. This is Dr. Frederick Wortham, MD. Uh, he is a German-born psychiatrist who in the 1940s, late 1940s and early 1950s, waged a one-man crusade against the comic book uh, because it was fostering juvenile delinquency. Um, he had a lot of different complaints about how, how comic books affected just things like literacy. He, he said that breaking up uh, sentences into word balloons like that made it harder for kids to learn to read. Uh, he didn't spend too much of his time directly attacking Batman and Robin because he had bigger fish to fry. There were crime comics and horror comics, and he uh, would pull panels out of context like, uh, like I have just done, and, uh, and he would point out the uh, very racist stereotypes, the very sexist st uh, stereotypes, and the uh, incredible violence, about which dude had a point. I mean, uh, he actually chased hundreds of people out of the comics industry and caused uh, horror comics and crime comics to uh, basically just gutted them and caused a lot of publishing houses to close. Uh, but when it came to the crime and the horror comics, I mean, dude kind of had a point. Now, he also said that Superman was a Nazi, which must have come as a surprise to his Jewish creators and publishers and writers, but fine. He said that uh, Wonder Woman had a touch of um, something uh, sapphic to her, which had a point. And finally, when it came to Batman and Robin, I'm going to read what he said about Batman and Robin. He only devoted four pages to this book, um, four pages to Batman and Robin in this book uh, that, he, that he published in 1954. And what he said about them was not, well, here's what he said. I'm going to use a fakey German accent um, because I want to, and B, because uh, I did do the audiobook for this, uh, for this book, and uh, I did double check just to make sure he still had the accent. He never lost his uh, thick German accent. He was uh, born in Germany. So this is, uh, this is what he said about Batman and Robin. At home, they lead an idyllic life. They are Bruce, Wayne, and Dick Grayson. Bruce Wayne is described as a socialite, and the official relationship is that Dick is Bruce's ward. They live in sumptuous quarters with beautiful flowers and large vases and have a butler, Alfred, Bruce, is sometimes shown in a dressing gown. As they sit by the fireplace, the young boy sometimes worries about his partner. It is like a wish dream of two homosexuals living together. Now, um, dude had a point. Not, not the point that he thought he did. Uh, he went on to say that in a culture like America where homosexuality was the great taboo, uh, and remember, this is the 50s. This is the, the height of the Red Scare. This is when uh, Bolsheviks were coming for your children to turn them into panty waste. Like, there was a lot of fear going around at this time, and he just fed directly into that. What he said was, seeing all those beautiful flowers and large vases, uh, and seeing these two uh, males together, uh, would incite in young boys, and he's talking to two boys at this point, uh, young boys reading it, um, the sense that they might be gay. Now, dude had a point, but it was one that only applied to gay kids like me. Because uh, again, the feelings of guilt, shame, check, 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 check. But it's not, you, you would not, if you were a straight kid and you saw two guys hanging out in a house, you wouldn't, it would not even occur to you. If you were a gay kid and you saw two guys hanging around in a house, 
and you saw a, a, a panel like this, for example, yeah, you might, you might think there's something there. Now, this panel appeared in a comic book that was published in the spring of 1954, exactly as Dr. Frederick Wortham was testifying before Congress. So the universe kind of handed him this panel on a plate. Because again, it says, and it begins like any routine morning in the lives of millionaire Bruce Wayne and his ward. So this thing, sharing a bed, is routine. And they uh, have a good sleep, come on, Dick. A cold shower, a big breakfast. So what happens next? Uh, as I say, a lot of crime comics uh, go away. A lot of horror comics go away. Superheroes change. Uh, the most famous double act in comics, Batman and Robin, uh, becomes an ensemble. Uh, because having these two dudes hang out in the house together, even with their butler, was just a little too close to the line. So we introduce, uh, first comes Ace the Bat Hound. Uh, it's a dog in a mask, sure. Uh, then comes, uh, up in that upper uh, right corner, yeah, uh, Batmite, a, a interdimensional magical imp who wears a costume like Batman. Then comes Batwoman, and then comes Batgirl with a hyphen, not the same Batgirl that comes later. And then finally, and most awesomely, Mogo the Bat Ape. <laughs> For about 15 years, this is, he becomes kind of the patriarch of this family of people who dress up like bats. <laughs> This is Batman in 1965. Uh, whack, smiling, he's got a little, uh, they changed up his wardrobe a little bit, they gave him a circle around his bat insignia, which he didn't have before. Um, this is 1965. This is 1970. A uh, bit of a difference. Cartoon, photorealism. And I'm, I say photorealism advisedly because look at that, this is uh, Neil Adams' art. Uh, the moon is in front of you, and yet the shadow of Batman is falling forward. So again, ism, photorealism. And it's my favorite part of this whole thing is uh, he's standing over the graves of Dolores and Juan Muerto. Dolores and Juan, death. <laughs> Honey, the deaths are coming over. Oh, I hate when the deaths come over. So this is uh, the secret of the waiting graves. Um, what happened between 1965 and 1970? Anybody know? This dude happened. Uh, this show premiered in 1966. What they did when they made this television series was they realized that um, they could take advantage of the pop art movement that was cresting at the time. Pop art valued things that were colorful, that were mass produced, that were cheesy, uh, th that were disposable, comics. Pop art, the pop art movement fetishized comics. Roy Lichtenstein made a career out of taking comic art panels and selling them for thousands of dollars in art, in, to art galleries and art museums. So they could take the existing comic, the Batman comic, and just not adapt it, not turn it into an adventure serial like they would uh, something else, but just pick it up, cut and paste it onto the television screen, fit it into a half an hour format. The difference is they would assert every cheesy, silly, kid-friendly aspect, every trope that, that is in, this, in, this, in these 1965, 64 comics uh, with a tremendous sense of gravity. The way the producers described it to their writers, as if we are dropping the bomb on Hiroshima. This is how heavy, this is how serious we want everybody to take it. There is no winking uh, to the camera. Uh, there's no mugging. It is all as delivered as straight as possible. And it became, because of that disconnect, because of that uh, because kids loved it, because again, pow zap, um, and it was colorful and it looked great, and adults loved it because it was funny as hell. Uh, the people who didn't love it were the nerds. Uh, they were there in 1966, uh, writing into fanzines, going nuts about this show. Uh, I found several people just completely outraged by the notion of this show and how it was making fun of their character. In fact, it wasn't making fun, as I, as I point out in the book, this was, if you want somebody to take Batman seriously, this show takes Batman seriously, the Batman of those 1964 comics. Uh, but man, they hated it. So, what, uh, when the show was over, uh, and it, this fad faded quickly. Within two years, they had three seasons, something like 128 episodes, which is why it lived on in syndication forever. Uh, the makers of um, Batman comics, and all DC comics, basically, uh, said, they looked around, they found out that their 
kid audience was pretty much gone. Who were reading comics now were those nerds, uh, the teens and adults. And teens and adults wanted something a little bit meatier. They wanted something, uh, they wanted heroes like Marvel heroes who had uh, troubles, who couldn't pay the rent, whose, whose Aunt May was dying, who uh, were angst ridden, who had feelings of inadequacy. Um, because they, 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 we went from having comics to be you know, kid wish fulfillment to adolescent wish fulfillment uh, and all that entails. So at the same time this was happening, the comic book industry basically decided to, to cut kids loose and to focus on the teen and adult audience. Uh, I call it the great inward turn. So they get out of the spinner racks in grocery stores and we start to see the first uh, fan shops, the first comic book shops where nerds can kind of be among their own and dissect storylines and point out where there's been some contradiction in canon. Uh, and so what Denny O'Neill, who was the writer of this, uh, this reboot of Batman, what he decided to do was to look back to that first year of Batman comics for something that he could, uh, he could use, he could excavate, and find an affinity with this new audience of older teens and adults. And he found that oath. That oath went from being a single plot point. Like the thing, this is how you describe, this is how you get him into the getup, right? You just, every, every hero has an origin. We just have to kind of tick that box to get him in to put all the bad ears. He decided that what, what Batman needed to do was have an obsession, okay? This is the 70s. Pop psychology is becoming a thing. Uh, and we need this oath to be the thing that is all consuming. Now he has, when you give him obsession like that, you also give him a personality. He's, he's, he's aloof, he's grim, he is increasingly gritty, but he wasn't quite done. Most important thing to do after that, get rid of the kid. So they ship Dick Grayson off to Hudson University uh, and effectively ending at this point the Batman-Robin partnership, which to this day still has these connotations. The ghost of Frederick Wortham hangs over these characters whenever you see Batman and Robin together. Um, and again, it's, it's not entirely fair, but it's, it's, it's a thing you have to kind of deal with. So we can get rid, of, uh, get rid of Dick Grayson as fast as possible. So then for the next 15 years, you have uh, in that upper left corner, that's the Batman that we saw in comics. Dark, grim, gritty, violent. Uh, why is the Joker holding a fish? Never mind, not important, <laughs> it's in the book. You wanna, you wanna find out why he's holding the fish, it's in the book. But comics at this point were read by a few thousand people. The Batman that the rest of the world saw is the one there in the lower right, uh, the Super Friends Batman, who drove around in a car that looked like the uh, television show, the 66 television show, who called Robin old chum, uh, who palled around like this. So again, Batman alone, as a grim Avenger of the Night in the comics, but that Batman uh, uh, in mass media on television, seen and enjoyed by millions. This is when the, the difference emerges between Batman the character and Batman the idea. Nerds like me love Batman the character. We love all the interplay, we love this kind of endless iteration that goes on, um, and we, we treasure the reboots and retcons and we we, we love having these, again, these Talmudic dissections of what's going on in the comics. Uh, that's nerds. Normals want a story. Just tell me a story. Just give me the bullet points. Um, and that's the Batman, the idea, that uh, con continued to exist in the public mind for 15 years until 1985 and 1986. This is Batman the Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. Um, this book was a phenomenon when it came out. Uh, because, well, in the book I, I try to pick it apart. Uh, he wasn't writing this book for the nerds he knew were Batman fans. Uh, they were already in the back pocket. They were gonna buy the book regardless. It was like this special mini-series on prestige paper. He knew that they were there in his back pocket. He was writing this book for the people over the wall of the little nerd enclave that, that uh, comics had built around themselves. He was pointing, like Babe Ruth, out beyond the wall to those people those normals, for whom Batman meant pow zap. If they remembered Batman at all, if they gave him even a passing thought, they thought about two dudes fighting, having big brawls in these candy-colored warehouses, pow zap. That's why 
you can actually read this book, Dark Knight Returns, as the story of what would happen if the Adam West Batman came back uh, and found that the old tropes, the old ways of doing things didn't work anymore. So you can see when he introduces Batman in, that, in the upper left-hand corner, that is as close as you're going to get to the, uh, to the Neil Adams, yes, but also the, the um, uh, Adam West Batman. Uh, then he kind of walks people through uh, the history of the character. So we get an old costume right there in the middle. We also, to take any of that weirdness between Batman and Robin out of it, he makes Robin a girl. Boom. No, no homoeroticism anymore. That's all you got to do. Gone. And then uh, we also have him fight Superman in a, uh, in a battle which uh, is, is, we're still getting elements of today. Uh, this Friday, we're going to get this, this, this pretty much this panel right here over and over and over again. Um, and this is, he introduces this, on, this concept of conflict. They were pals. They were like, remember when, you're too young, but remember when Tom and Jerry, uh, when they were on the television in the 70s and 80s, uh, they were became pals because you know, they didn't want, to, the parents groups were complaining that uh, there was too much violence, so they just kind of hung out together. Well, that's what Superman and Batman for most of their history, until 1985, when uh, Frank Miller introduces conflict. So. One of the uh, things that uh, I, I talk about in the book a lot is that a character like Batman is a comic book character. Comic books are basically soap operas. Narrative, endless iterating narrative without an ending. Uh, these characters are heavily licensed nuggets of, of intellectual property who are not supposed to grow and change. Uh, they are not supposed to uh, do what fiction characters, fictional characters, do what makes a story a story is you have an ending, and the person is a different person at the end of the story than they are at the beginning. Can't happen with Batman unless you do some kind of Elseworlds stuff. But what Frank Miller did was he knew that if I give this, if we look at this character at the end of his career, all of a sudden the stakes are rising because his physical prowess isn't where, where it was, where he's at the height of his career, and also at the beginning of his career. So that's what Batman Year One, which he wrote the next year, does. It basically says. Here's how he came to be, but he doesn't go through the origin again. We don't. We see. We get a glimpse of the guns and the pearls and the everything, but he mo mostly comes. It's a process piece. It's basically how do I go from a guy who wants, who I know I want what I want to do, how do I get to uh, that guy right there? Now, when you take a character like Batman out of the comic book page and you put him into any other medium, you change him. For the better, for the worse, sometimes, doesn't matter. We'll see. Uh, but what you're doing is you are overlaying your own stuff, your own baggage on top of the character. Tim Burton's kind of outsider emo weirdness on top of the character. Joel Schumacher's whatever the hell that was on top of the character. <laughs> uh, uh, Christopher Nolan's concerns with the surveillance state and terrorism, and it doesn't really hang together, but uh, never mind, it's, it's important. He's kind of drafting on big ideas. And then you got uh, Ben Affleck up there. I, I, that is just the funniest. Doesn't it look like he just is, is like he's taking a class picture and he doesn't want to be there? <laughs> just like he's like a sullen emo kid, which, you know, story checks out. So, again, to adapt this character is to, is to change the character. Uh, and, you know, in, in the very first 1989 Batman film, who killed Bruce Wayne's parents? The Joker. Because that is the action movie. Trope. That is, uh, you, when you put a character that doesn't end into an action movie, you give him the three-act structure. You give him the love interest. You give him the rising action. You give him the big reveal that the thing that happened in the first reel is uh, solved by the thing that happens in the end. It turns Batman into Charles Bronson when you have this revenge story. And the thing th about superheroes is that they are not action movie heroes. They do not kill. They have restraint. It would be the easiest thing in the world to have uh, Batman just kind of go in with an Uzi and mow things down, but he's not Rambo. He has restraint. He has genre conventions. Within genre conventions, you have creativity. If you do away the genre conventions, you're not writing a Batman story. Now, people ask me which of these, or the one in the in the books, which is my Batman. The whole point of the book is that there's many different Batman. Many different Batman exist. We project onto this character which one which one we want. Uh, my Batman uh, is not the Adam West one, although I I love him. Uh, my Batman is the one that I think nailed it. Uh, you have, we have taken this character out of the comic book medium many times. Only once did we nail it, and that is Batman the Animated Series in the early 90s. Again, all those other forms of media 
put the directors, the writers, the screenplays, the studios, baggage on top of the character. This uh, series stripped everything else away, leaving us with as close a view as we're ever gonna get of who Batman is and why he does what he does. It's also just, in terms of design, it's, it's amazing. You're basically taking the comic book and, and giving it fluidity and movement and strength. Um, and also, and I don't think this is a coincidence, the half hour syndicated format of the animated series is as close as we can get to the comic book format, where things don't really change at the end, or he's still the same dude, but over the course of time, over the course of several seasons, we can uh, allow a little bit more breathing room in there. We can actually make a character. Uh, we, can, we can give, we can have some funnier episodes, some darker episodes. We can allow these relationships between these characters to deepen and to actually allow for characterization. So I'm gonna close with a very short story, which is that I was at um, Comic-Con in 2013, doing some research for the book, interviewing people, uh, and it was the last day of the convention floor, and it was 2013. There were Batman all over the damn place. Uh, they were all the Christopher Nolan Batman, and you can spot them. Now, if you've never been to Comic-Con, it's just this giant floor bursting with color and lights and sounds, and you could see the Christopher Nolan Batman from a mile away because they were just absorbing light. They were, they were like these little black worker ants that were kind of mulling about the floor. They were all pissed. Uh, they were all doing very method. I smiled at one when he passed me and he kind of growled. I was like, good for you. Wait, well, 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 well done. And then I turned and I saw uh, Batman, uh, the Adam West Batman. Um, and it was perfect. Every detail of that costume was spot on. The, uh, the, the, the wrinkles of the evening gloves, the, uh, the, little, the, the tininess of the insignia, which makes it seem more polite somehow, like he doesn't want to make a big thing, uh, the, the, the bulkiness of the, of the utility belt, and the cowl, which had these weird like drag queen eyebrows drawn on it for no reason, none. And uh, I was like, dude, that is, that is perfect. Do you have any idea how perfect that is? And he said to me, uh, do you want a picture? And I said, well, I, I hadn't, but now all of a sudden I very much did. So I was like, yes, definitely. So I, you know, I, and I, I haven't, I didn't take pictures of people there because I just didn't. Uh, so he backs up into the, into the aisle and uh, I'm like, okay. And he says, do you want me to pose? And I, again, I hadn't, but now, sure, do it, go nuts. <laughs> Isn't that perfect? Look at that guy. Okay, so that's, he's doing the Batusi. What I want to point out here is the paunch. The paunch is perfect. Right next to him, you can't see it, but there was a, a 300 soldier dude, you know, the Frank Miller 300 soldier guy, who was just jacked and had 0% body fat. And you could tell that this guy just, you know, ate, ate chicken breasts and guzzled muscle milk. So I figured that there must be some kind of training procedure for that paunch. That must be like pasta buffets and schlitz, I think, is the way you get <laughs> to that thing right there. Um, and again, I, I should point out as well uh, that it's not fair to Adam West to kind of concentrate on the paunch because Adam West, was trim. His stunt double had a bit of a, a bit of a thing. So every time you see them fighting, uh, yeah, you get a little bit of a wiggle. But that's that was uh, that was the end of my Comic Con experience. All right, so let's uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's do some questions. If anybody has any questions about any aspect of the stuff I kind of breezed through right then. Oh, uh, first, uh, thanks you so much for coming here to speak with us. Sure. Um, I wish I could ask you this after the review embargo for Batman vs Superman lifted, but um, let's try it anyway. Um, I guess, how do you feel about the sort of the direction the DC cinematic universe is kind of taking Batman, the newest movie? Yeah, I haven't seen it, so I can talk. I, I, I know because actually the, um, the the press screening uh, is actually uh, tomorrow night when I'm having the book launch. So I feel I think that's the universe kind of give, cutting me a break. Um, they learned the wrong lesson from Green Lantern, which um, uh, Green Lantern sucked. But it didn't suck because there were jokes. It didn't suck because they tried to inject some humor into it. It sucked for a whole host of reasons. And to go a, a, a to try to fit the Christopher Nolan model, uh, uh, the tone, uh, onto a character like that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Grim, dour, gritty, story checks out. To try to fit it on the Man of Steel, 
on Superman is a, it's just a fundamental misread of who this character is. They are not the same. They, they work uh, in the same universe, but they, you have to deal with them in very different tones. So, uh, you know what? I, I, I said on the Pop Culture Happy Hour that I believe that this, this film could be good. Um, the more I read about it, the more I see it. Uh, I, I really, I live in a tortured kind of hope. Um, but uh, just this morning, uh, Ben Affleck said, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to take my kid to see it. <laughs> you, it's, so the, the story about the detective ninja and the flying guy, you, it's not for kids. None of this stuff is for kids. It doesn't make any sense to me. I guess, would you say it's kind of going through its own inward turn? Or Sorry. No, sure. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact. I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't know how old Zack Snyder is, but something happened in the 90s to comics where they became more extreme and uh, violent, and it was uh, all splash pages, spectacle over storytelling. But there's an old saw that the comics you loved when you were 13 are the comics that you will always love, um, and, and whatever they are. And I have a feeling Zack Snyder read a lot of 90s comics because this movie looks like an image comic brought to life. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. It was interesting what you just said about the 90s and the sort of extreme era of comics. Uh, it seems that with Batman, he's often tonally based by the authors who are handling him. Yep. Like you said, this is true of the movies as well. Uh, and I also noticed that it's sort of a repetitive cycle that when he gets too dark is when they reintroduce a Robin. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it could be possible for a film Robin to come and maybe clean up the darkness of film Batman? Uh, when you get a Robin introduced in the films previously, it's by Joel Schumacher, who uh, brought in a Robin who uh, was given to tank tops and he had an earring, and it was basically basically rough trade Robin. Uh, and that's not necessarily the way you lighten the <laughs> mood. That's not the way you necessarily uh, uh, turn the cycle. He goes through this, um, he, and he's done it several times over the years, where he is the lone vigilante, then he is the father figure to Robin, then he is the leader of this giant brood, and then, again, as you say, they ditch. The, the, over and over again, they ditch the kid, they ditch the brood to get him back to grim and gritty. Uh, you can see in a, uh, there was a series in the, in the mid-aughts uh, into the tens uh, called Batman the Brave and the Bold, which was an animated series that injected a little bit of humor. You can see now merch from the uh, 1966 television series after a period of time when uh, DC Comics wanted to pretend like that never existed because they wanted grim, they wanted gritty, they wanted that version of Batman to be the only version of Batman. Now, it wasn't necessarily because they were afraid of it. There's all kinds of rights issues with getting any kind of imagery from that series because if you remember, every episode had a guest star a guest villain, and so they had to get the rights from the guest villain and, so, uh, and then work with their estates, and so it just took years. But now, if you look around, you can see uh, some light being injected back into the, into the whole universe. So now, as I say, the way it should be is that there's a Batman for everybody. Yes? Yeah, when it comes to the Christopher Nolan trilogy, um, what is your biggest concern with like, the whole uh, surveillance state sort of story, and also, this is a two-part question, mm -hmm. um, from Adam West to Ben Affleck, who do you think, which Batman had the best chin? Ah, see? <laughs> there is a, uh, a chapter on the chin. Uh, <laughs> it actually keeps coming back. Um, I, I kept writing all these, uh, these reviews of these films as they were coming out, and at one point, Roger Ebert says, uh, I think Clooney has the best chin. Uh, it's a thing, because it's the only thing you see of the character, of the, of the actor. It's the, it's the only thing you see. In, in the era of Kevlar suits, you know, how, what the guy is, whether or not there's a dimple, uh, matters hugely, because Bob Kane used to draw him as, like, basically Dick Tracy, square-jawed, and it's, it's hugely important to the character uh, in a weird way that, that nerds hold on to. I, I, I say in the book that, you know, Batman speaks to the... Uh, ideal of masculinity of every 12-year-old kid who's had his lunch money stolen one too many times. Bruce Wayne appeals to the desire to look great in a tux. So you need both. Um, as for the surveillance state, I thought that was interesting. I just didn't think it hung together. I, it makes sense. I mean, Batman, you know, uh, in the comics, there have been all these stories about Batman making contingency plans, contingency plans, planning everything out, observing everybody, spying on everybody. It makes sense that this character, who is paranoid and obsessed, would go down that road. It felt, as I said, like 
Nolan was sort of drafting off of a big idea and not necessarily engaging with it. I don't think that there's a consistent viewpoint about the surveillance state that you can define from that film. I don't think there's a consistent viewpoint about terrorism that you can define from that film. It's, it's there. He, he came to these big ideas and he said, let's do something with it, and he did something with it, but it's not like necessarily a through line. Yes, who's next? Um, can I go? Sure. Um, so you spoke in the beginning about there being a lot of killing mm -hmm. in the comics, and then they did away with that for the children. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, there's the principled never kill. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a bit about the arc about Batman killing versus not killing? Sure. Taking of this? Uh, yeah, it's been it's been a part of the character since about uh, the, the, since after his first year when he you know mowed people down with that machine gun. They said no, let's make sure he never kills. And then when uh, creators of the comic want to uh, do something splashy and make a make a big impact, they show him on the cover with a gun. Uh, the 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 restraint against firearms is a part of the character, which is why when I see in the <coughs> 1989 Batman film uh, the uh, the guns on the Batmobile, uh, when I play Batman uh, Arkham City, and there's guns, uh, rubber bullets, of course, but still, there's guns on the on the Batmobile. Like that's a that's a cop out for rubber bullets. Uh, it's 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 something that I think is hugely important because we are not making a, a story about an action movie hero. When action movie heroes kill the villain, we get this cathartic, yeah, that's a big part of the action movie experience. Um, so we don't mind that Charles Bronson wipes people out. We don't mind that Clint Eastwood wipes people out. This guy is dedicated to preserving life. And for him to kill is a fundamental um, undoing of, of, of his mission statement. Um, he, is, he is trying to keep that trauma, anybody else from suffering the trauma that he suffered as a kid. So, yes. Cool. Uh, thank you so much for coming, by the way. Sure. Really appreciate it. Um, and in the spirit of nerding out, I have a good question for you that I think is one that's gone on multiple times and people, many people have asked over the course of time. Mm -hmm. so I'm curious what your opinion is. Uh, what, are you, what is your thought in regards to, you know, who is the mask or is it a mask within a mask? Is Bruce Wayne the mask? Is Batman the mask? Is it actually a mask within a mask? And really in his inner child, he's this little fluffy marshmallow of emotion and wanting yeah. to be happy, you know? Yep. So what is, what is your thought on that? Uh, I was just talking to Sarah Beth about this. Uh, there's an uh, episode of the animated series where uh, Batman has some kind of, uh, no, it's, it's a Batman um, Beyond, uh, where Batman is having some kind of mental trauma and the way he figures out that he was not going insane and that uh, it was all an illusion was because in, in one of the versions of Batman basically calls him Bruce and he says, in my head, I don't call myself Bruce. Uh, I think, Anybody who plays the character is playing three versions of him. He's playing uh, the Griff, swear to me, Batman. Uh, he's, he's, he's playing uh, the kind of socialite, smarmy jerk. And he's playing the, the survivor of the trauma uh, that he suffered as a youth, uh, that Bruce Wayne. And I think that Bruce Wayne is as close as you get, but I, th I do think Batman is his reaction to this thing. His, so his true self, I think, is Batman. And I have a completely unrelated question. Sure. Everyone's okay with that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you didn't touch on, as we went back to like the, the death of, say, Jason Todd, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was an impactful thing. That was an interesting thing that was kind of driven by, um, I, I don't know if I want to say commercialism, but, you know, they, they let people have a poll to actually make a decision on it that was, like, shockingly close. Yep. And so I'm curious, uh, does that play into what you think of the development of the character and also the development of the character in the space of like the commercial world. Basically. Yes. Uh, again, they periodically throw the kid under the rug, literally <laughs> six feet under the rug, uh, to, to get him back to basics, to restart. Uh, in the case of Jason Todd, they couldn't figure out how to write him. Uh, he was an insolent punk, and uh, I voted to kill him. I was one of the... Thousands of people who voted to off the little, the little kid because he was uh, surly <laughs> and, and he was he was a jerk uh, and yeah it's it was a huge event. None of them who did that event they they ran a poll should we kill Jason Todd or should we let him live uh, and people voted. The margin was you know only about eight thousand or so people voted or something like that. But the margin was seventy two votes. One of mine was put it over the top. Uh, and yes, it's, it, they didn't expect it to become the big uh, to-do that it did. Uh, they, they were, uh, because everybody within the, it's kind of like what happened when they killed 
Superman. Everybody in the industry knew that it was a marketing stunt, uh, but Newsweek didn't. Um, the New York Times didn't. Uh, they thought this was actually a, a permanent change because they don't know how superhero comics work, where everything comes back. Uh, and Jason Todd has come back. And it's, it's because, again, we have to keep this story going. And that means things like um, logical sense go out the wayside and we just churn. It's, it's a, a constant churn of character and ideas and narrative. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I would kill him again. <laughs> Thumbs up to that. Thanks. All right, I think that's it. Uh, I want to thank you guys for having me very much. I uh, enjoyed it. And if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll be over there signing books. And uh, thanks again.